think we will start even those people are still coming in. Um, today we have a very good topic again, I would say. Uh, and it's nice to see uh, so many familiar faces and also some new faces. Um, so I think I can just will hand over the word to uh, Linus Kronevik, who is uh, from uh, working uh, together with Martin Berg at the wireless car, which is a very interesting in, um, organization as well. Thank you, Ingela. Yeah, right. <clears throat> My name is uh, Linus Kronevik. Um, and uh, working at, at uh, wireless car, that is a super interesting company, just like you said said um we very very short we uh, work with the helping the automotive industry uh, or let's say car makers primarily into the digital society we enable safe smart and sustainable mobility so this could typically mean like in how we are connecting actually cars to the cloud which enables super smart services for customers like how you can unlock your car like from your your uh, your phone etc cetera, etc cetera. a lot can be said about that uh, but that should be another topic uh, but wireless car yeah we have been around for for quite some time uh, and uh, today we'll really dig into how we work um, with the team development um, and uh, Maybe I should say something there. I mean, I think that something that is super interesting with also wireless car is as a basis that we will, won't talk that much about today, but it is the, actually the culture. So if I should bring up one really, really good thing with the wireless car, it is our culture, which we build everything upon. So just bring that with you into what we are also going to talk about when we come to, to talk about team development. Um, so what I'm doing, I'm working both with team development uh, and a part of the team development crew being also the lead driver for that. That was actually why I came to Wireless Car to actually work with and develop how we work with team development. Um, but I'm a part of a crew. We will touch upon that later. But I also work uh, uh, in a way of working team. Um, and that's another leg in my what I'm doing at Wireless Car. So Martin. Yep. Uh, hello, everyone. Martin Bay is my name. I'm I'm from Agile People, uh, of course, but I support here at Wireless Car within the team development crew, and and also support the Wireless Car in different organizational change that is needed in the organization. Uh, but we don't have to stay too much on me. So let's go, Ingela. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, we will give this presentation and then afterwards uh, we will give, uh, it will be an opportunity to ask questions. So you can do that by raising your hand or using the chat and you can place uh, questions in the chat during the presentation as well. Mm. Yeah, okay, thank you for saying that. Uh, so of course, yes, everyone is welcome to ask questions in the chat. Uh, and, and if Ingela feels that there's something that needs clarification uh, during our talk, uh, she will raise that and make sure that we support you in this. Uh, but we will want to save the questions until after, just so you have seen the full, full presentation first. So let's take you on our journey. It started before Linus actually joined Wireless Car, and it's been ongoing, of course, in the team, in the organization for a long time. You want team to be developing. So and I think most of you have seen these teams, the team that once upon a time you've seen it, the team that are highly productive, they are very focused, and they are nice to be around. They are, produce value, and they support each other, and they support the surrounding organization also in order to be do, do things. They finish both boring things and fun things. Uh, we want this team, the team that supports everyone. And our vision, of course, is to make sure that we have all, all of these teams are like this, that they support each other and they support the surrounding. But as most of you have seen, not all teams are like that. And that's because all teams are on a journey. Some teams have managed to get to a space where they have high effect effectiveness and efficiency and they support each other. Uh, yet some others 
are on the road there. They they support each other and they go there. They build the foundation of where they want to be and how they should work together in order to reach the target where they want to be. Yet other teams, they are on a place where they are more un unsecure. They don't really know where they are supposed to go. Uh, maybe they argue a lot. Uh, maybe they um, feel confused. Maybe they're even fighting internally. We see those teams also. And we also see the teams that is very leader dependent, that can't make things going unless they get support from someone to dive and support her in their direction. And we have all of these teams in all organizations. So in reality, it looks something like this, maybe. One problem that we see uh, in the agile context is that agility more or less assumes that all teams are in this position in the organization. Most frameworks, I would be blunt to say maybe, but they sort of assumes that teams are here where they are highly productive and supporting each other and have a good structure and um, behaviors that is supporting the team to produce value. Or even leaders, let's build a new team so that we can do productive things because we need this. And then we implement the team and the team doesn't start there. They start in on the left side somewhere and they need to go on that journey, all of them. So in some way or another, we at Wireless Car want to build a, a framework or a structure that supports the team to do this journey as quickly as possible and as safe as possible. Right, Linus? Exactly. So this is something that we we have actually talked about this quite a lot actually. I mean, we have been at at uh, several companies and we have seen kind of the same patterns. That sometimes it feels like we're kind of leaving teams alone in in uh, in in some sense uh, where they need to manage on their own. Um, sure, there can be support around, but is it enough? And that's where we think that maybe not uh, and wanted to try something else so if we take next next on that to like, like give this kind of surrounding support not in the controlling way of course but in the supporting way right to give the right amount and we will touch upon it a little bit more uh, and this is so important i think also especially when we have teams like in our context at wireless car more or less no, none of our team can actually work on completely on their own. They're a part of a of a context. They need to collaborate with others, like we sometimes call it, like in the scaled context, right? So that means we need to collaborate with other teams. Teams need to collaborate with others, but also we need to collaborate tightly with the customer. In our case, right? So this is so important, uh, and. This is the place in the teams. That is really where things are happening. I'm not sure how how well you are know about like like uh, software industry and how to make that. But I mean, in these teams, that's really where we are coding. That that is really where things are happening. Where we are maintaining our services. I touched upon like the example before, like how you can unlock your car from your phone. These are the heroes that are making that that works every day and you can think that but if you have implemented implemented it once will it won't it stay like that yeah but it needs to stay safe so that no one can hack it etc 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 that is super important so we need to take care of that over time also so this is really where things are happening uh, in an organization like ours so if we take next slide we think that putting the teams in center really to really uh, enable to have these these well-being teams because like i just said this is where things are happening so we need to make this this environment really really good right so we have this well-being teams so that uh, people also want to be a part of this uh, so we have these in well-being individuals because the team is of course built up by individuals it's of course it's obvious uh, for sure but it's so important um to, to think about. Uh, and this is also what builds up a well-being company. 
that actually can make our customers awesome in the end. Um, so we can just take next step. Um, if we thinking about a little bit like developing our this support that we talked about. So if we think about where, where we started out, I touched upon just before we had these teams and in quite many of our teams, we had a Scrum Master uh, working together with the team. Not all teams, actually. Um, some years ago, it started to become more and more common that we, we have that dedicated Scrum Masters for, for our development teams. Um, but, uh, and you could think like, yeah, but, like I touched upon before, isn't this enough? And actually what we have discovered, like I said before, uh, in quite many cases, uh, it's actually quite troublesome. And uh, both Martin and I, we have been in this role. It's quite challenging. And I think that if you have been in that that role, it is actually quite quite hard uh, to make it work and to make it work in the, in the, in the bigger picture, in, in the larger context. So what we did and tried out, and this was really trying things out. Uh, so if we take next slide, please. Was to create this kind of cross-functional supporting team that we call at Wireless Car, we call it the team development crew. Uh, and the whole idea is here to not take over any of responsibilities. We are very, very actually uh, clear about that. We are not taking over anything from like, like a Scrum Master or any other roles or developers in a team, but we want to give the support that they need. So we have actually set up the, the purpose of this, uh, this crew is that we want to support our growing organization in building this environment where teams and people can thrive and feels motivated to deliver the highest value to our end customers. And that I think is so important there that we create the environment where people and both teams and people can thrive. So this is a truly cross-functional team. So we brought together uh, people from uh, people and culture. Uh, we brought the people from, from uh, line management we uh, line managers, we uh, brought in uh, Scrum Masters, of course. Uh, we had people from like way of working uh, area, the ones building like the framework of how we work and such. Uh, and what we do then is that we uh, working on like coaching and individuals, building up the different tools. Uh, and there, uh, Martin, you will talk a little bit more about one of our tools. Yes, so so one of the tools that we started on with they were quite early, actually tried out before the team development crew was even initiated, um, was the GDQ. Uh, I will talk about the GDQ, well, what it is and what it comes from, but it's a tool that supports us and the supporters team in order to be able to understanding what they are um, doing. Maybe a few of you have heard about it. So what we did in order to test and verify that this is a valuable tool for us was that we first had a few tests and runs with different teams to see if it works. And then we decided to do a proof of concept to verify that we can actually follow it and, and use the process in a good way. And when we had that in place, we have, uh, as of now done, I think 100 GDQs in, in, with the teams. Uh, some of them have done it for times and some of them have done it once and so forth. I will talk about what it is now. So GDQ stands for Group Development Questionnaire. It's from, it's a, and it's a tool to identify team stages and give support to the team. So the team can fill in this form for themselves to understand what stage a team is in or their, their team is in. And it also gives them a subscale analysis of things that could be interesting to focus on for a team to develop further. Okay, I'm talking about team stages, and you probably have heard about forming, storming, norming, performing. Uh, we are sort of talking about that, but we are talking about uh, the integrated model of group development, which is uh, the tool or the model that we decided to use as our base model for team development at Wireless Car. It's been developed by Susan Whelan in the early 1990s. 
And it's a, as it says, integrated model of group development. So it integrates previous theories and models and verifies that they are true. So Bruce Hackman's model, uh, forming, norming, storming, performing in different orders. Uh, she confirms that that is there. And then she makes uh, made a bit of a modification to them, you can say, so that they are more true to the point. Um, I will talk a bit about these stages for you so that you have a, a, a better understanding of what we are supporting. So what if I take you through the different stages here? The first one is called dependence and inclusion. That's where the team are new or the perspective of the team is new in some way or another. And in that space, the team is starts, is quite unsecure what they need and what they should have and where they are supposed to go. So we're very leader dependent in this, that situation. We also call it the honeymoon sometimes because the team feels very happy in this space. They feel that they are producing value and they are doing things most of the time. But at some point, the team starts to feel safe together because we're in this stage one. It's much, in Sweden, we call it fika time. People are happy, interacting, talking. But that's because uh, we want to get to know each other in a better way. We want to learn what type of levels we should put ourselves on in order to be able to later on then, unknowingly most of the time, start to challenge behaviors and structures. And that's why we enter stage two, because then we have enough trust on ourselves, and the psychological safety is on a high enough level for the team to start to have a counter dependency to each other and start to fight in different sense. So uh, that is when you start to feel like the way that we are doing things in this team is not the best, I think. I have my feeling and I want to share that with the group. And that's where it could start to go bad if we don't have a good behavior there. Uh, but if the team and when the team manage to get out of that, they have formed the platform of how this team works together. We will have our roles, we have our structures, what we want to achieve, and we have a good way of handling different type of conflicts, different opinions about how to solve things. And that's where we are. Then we are in stage three, which is called trust and structure. And what we can see in research is that that's where the team starts to produce a lot of much more value. And we can see that from the graph on the bottom here, that stage one team, yeah, they are often perceiving themselves at least to be quite productive. And I think it's because uh, that uh, they have a strong leadership most of the time, so that someone is helping them to move forward in a direction that's important. But then when they enter stage two, the team needs to go much more inwards, have conflicts, have discussions. How do we solve things? And of course, productivity goes down. They also perceive that they are less productive in that stage. And then, as you can see in the curve, stage three, the team grows. They feel productive. They know what they do. They want to support each other in the best way. And in stage four, of course, that's even more so, which is why it's called work and productivity. Mm -hmm. But, okay, now we've been talking about teams, but what is a team, Linus? Yeah, you could think like, uh, isn't that very obvious, <laughs> right? But when we started to dig into this a little bit in a more structured manner, we actually thought that this is actually quite important. To, to actually be able to answer that question. So this is our answer in our context at Wireless Car. We came up with this, that the team is a group of people who combine their effort and knowledge to fulfill a common purpose. That is what it is. And if we look into so what like uh, makes it a team, it is that they have this, this formal team purpose. They consist of three uh, or more people. and we have a clear team membership. So it's not that like, like we are switching out people every week. Then I think we should maybe call it like a meeting or something like that, or, or a community of practice maybe, or something like that. That is not what we call a team, at least. Um, so could it become a team? Yeah, it could. 
but uh, yeah so it's just to try to to frame it a little bit and that was one of our learnings like okay we actually need to talk about but because that question comes up quite often actually are are these people really a team and maybe we should say that also here when we talk about teams at wildscar we are not only talking about uh, development teams uh, that's maybe the most obvious uh, i saw there were a question how many uh, and maybe someone answered it for us but but i think uh, we actually talk, think about all also the ones that are working in supporting function functions also uh, at wireless car so it can really differs uh what it is but maybe it's um yeah but the gross that. the gross part of the team are of course development teams uh, they are i think 70 or 80 yeah. percent of all the teams in the organization yeah. something like that so so uh, we're around like 50 60 development team and then we have like yeah a 10 15 more so yeah uh, i think when you talked about gdq i think we have met up with at least 60 unique teams now uh, and done around 100 like you said uh, um, sessions with those so like you said we have met several of them we have met uh, several times in this structured way uh, right so uh, looking into another area how we do and uh, and uh, create this support is that we have built up a toolbox that we call team development toolbox easy as that uh, so what is that? Uh, it, it contains a lot of exercises, workshops, and guides, um, and we have stolen a lot uh, <laughs> from, uh, maybe you have been part of creating some of it, uh, I don't know, uh, we have take, taken it from, from everywhere, uh, but uh, like from if you have looked into like a liberating structure, uh, it uh, could be from um, sociocracy, management 3.0, etc etc all kind of tools or practices uh, exercises etc etc and then we have tried to tailor it to fit into our context to make it super easy to bring in it could be if i take one example uh, liberating structure have a great uh, if you haven't tried it they have a great uh, exercise or workshop that is called purpose to practice that really helps a team nailing quite a lot of the parts that we have been talking about and will touch upon um that is great so we have taken it into our context tried to tailor it a little bit to make it super easy but also how we can help out with it could be that someone have tried it out this and learned how to to run it then we can have people supporting each other in doing this in different things that's like the way that i talked about before not taking away like responsibility from like a scrum master but how can we connect people to help out each other and uh like with with the tools or yeah tips ids tricks um, and so on but we have also tried to connect this to the different stages so what kind of workshop could you to to use in 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 different stages and so on to give some more my more guidance there and then we try to help out uh, as much we can uh, it could be a team that are let's say that they are quite a lot into uh, maybe having conflicts etc it can be so nice to have a third party stepping in to facilitate such such uh, sessions um, and could really help out sorting out those those uh, questions because you're actually when you're when you are a part of it it's, it's quite hard to actually facilitate the really great great sessions there so yeah that was shortly about that uh, one, one thing that i can add there is that this yeah, it's yeah. Say, collaboratively built so we're, yeah, we it's you. not just we in the team development crew that add tools here but scrum masters and others mm -hmm. are supporting mm -hmm. us in developing things there and we are of course supporting them to, in order to be able to map them to the integrated model of group development and we're doing it collaboratively mm -hmm. and it's growing daily or weekly with new yeah. things and and people also add themselves to i know how i tried this one so then people can know that they can uh, reach out to that person to get support about their per perspective of how to use the tool so growing and evolving uh changing and being tailored uh all the time uh, now we're going to look into um what it can look uh, look like in in reality um so if we take next slide there yeah. 
And Martin, this is actually a team that you have met up with, right? Yep, this is a team that I've been working with, and maybe uh, some people here in the in the group also recognize this team. Uh, I think I've been working closely together with a Scrum Master uh, in doing this uh, and supporting this team. So what we see here is actually three different GDQs. So from the left, we had a GDQ that was done in November 2021, and then in June 2022, the one in the middle, and then in December 2022. Uh, what we can see here from the graphs could be hard to know if you don't, you're not familiar with GDQ and how they present the data, but what you see here in the first graph is that the team is, is a stage one team. And then they go into, in June here, the team, what we can see here also, what we need to confirm together with the team, of course, in our workshops is that, yeah, this team is starting to enter stage two. That is what we can see from the graphs there. Uh, and then in December, 2022, the graphs clearly indicates that the team is now in a stage four. They view themselves to be there. So this is a good example of how we use the tool to support the Scrum Master and the team to move in the different stages of development. And for the, for the background of it, of course, there are challenges both within the team, in the technical surrounding that was in the team of, of how to approach those things. And uh, I remember when I met the team on a on a the work or something like that in the, in the in the company, they were so happy. I met them around there December 2022 or slightly right after and I, I they talked about some key events that had happened that made it impossible for them to even do this turnover which I identified as the steps when they moved from stage two into stage three and uh, so it's so great to see a team that has managed to get to that space because everyone in, in teams that are in stage three and four are much more happier and and well-being because they feel that they produce value and they have a purpose of why they are supposed to be there so it's very nice to be close to teams when they they manage to get there on the productivity level we can also see uh, the change so it's the the bottom graphs uh, and actually the first column is the interesting one because that's the self-evaluated productivity measurement for the team they rate themselves from one to four how productive are we and you can see it continues to rise and of course the team could still feel even more productive so i hope that we will do a gdq with this team soon because we aim to do it once every half half year but maybe I don't know if we said that but this is voluntarily all teams sign up for this voluntarily it's not we don't push this to teams they ask for it we ask them if they're interested if they are not they can do that of course they don't have to do the gdq mm -hmm. uh, which we feel is very important uh, still we have managed to get 100 teams to do it some some parts ask the teams to do it more fully but we do never ask that Hmm? So, so it's, you could feel like you got a, a lot of data here, <laughs> right? Uh, but really, the key takeaway here is to, that you see that we, uh, the idea is here to really work with it in a structured manner, where we really try to nail the areas also, because inside these pillars that you see in the data, behind that, we can actually see what we need to work on more. So that could be like that we identify an area that we really need to work more on. Like how can we have like uh, constructive conflicts, right? To be able to bring up uh, topics to discuss it and to be like come to a decision to move forward, et cetera, et cetera. And that is what we need to work on um, to be very precise in that and this structure manner where we are really following up, coming back to it, looking at the trends, um, really to try to understand the whole situation uh, for the team also. Uh, and that I would say is really the, the key here and that we want you to 
to just see that that uh, how we work with it in a very structured manner. Mm -hmm. Hope that yeah. shines through. Yeah, and now this team is a stage four team, and of course they don't need a scrum master anymore. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. important. I've been in stage four teams and supporting them, and they need a scrum master just as much as any other team do. Yeah, and they need that, someone that continues to support and challenge them. Yeah, and, and Martin, like uh, that is also something we have seen sometimes. Maybe you have heard it in, in some. I have heard it in a couple of organizations. Like, if we can just uh, move all the teams to be like high performing, uh, then we don't need uh, these uh, supporting functions anymore. We can remove them, uh, and that is just basically not true because we are also just from the fact that we are uh, change is a fact, it's happening all the time. Things are changing, customers are changing, people are changing, mm. right? People comes, people leave, <laughs> and we need to work on this continuously. Nothing is, is uh, static. It sounds obvious when you say it, but sometimes we tend to not remember that, uh, that these kind of things are really something you need to work on continuously. Maybe we should uh, move on into a couple of learnings. Uh, so that was actually one of the learnings uh, that you saw there to, to work really in this kind of structured way uh, with this to get these kind of results. It, it comes from quite hard work actually uh, behind that, that uh, slide that you just saw. Another one that we have identified and uh, uh, this could uh, 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 we are not saying that this could be in in general like that uh, for all companies, but I have seen it before at other companies. And uh, at Wireless Car, Car, we have seen this, that actually uh, when we started to look at this and have met up with quite many teams, we saw actually a pattern where we saw that quite many teams actually had a quite unclear purpose. And you could think like, how can that be <laughs> that you are developing stuff and like on daily basis, you're developing code and don't know the purpose. Yeah, but that was actually a problem that we quite often heard, like the purpose that people answered uh, about their team were that they said like, yeah, the purpose is to develop stuff. But that is not uh, enough when we look into uh, uh, this. We want more. We want to know the direction. So it's not just about completing tasks. It's about where we are heading, what direction we have uh, in a team. And that is so important to nail that area. And that's also why, we, why you also saw that into the definition of the team, right? That we have a common formal purpose. Everything starts there, more or less, um, because that is really what makes us a team. Um, or set up the need for a team right um, if we don't have that we actually don't might not need the team then we can hand out tasks to to individuals uh, but we don't believe in that so but if we have it it creates really creates alignment because we know what mountain to climb right um, that creates focus that makes things much easier to uh, when it comes to making decisions in a team or prioritization that is so hard to make, right? Uh, me and my own team needed to do that just a couple of months. And it's so hard every time when you need to scoop out things that you think is super important. But if you have this clear common purpose, you know where you're heading, uh, it's at least easier, not easy, but easier. Um, and we have seen that this in our context, it really need to be connected to the scaled context of the team, really need to be clearly connected. Uh, because sometimes when you work with this in a, in a team, it could be that they say that, yeah, but this is, we cannot affect this um, because it's, it's into the larger context. Um, and then you need to work with that context. So that's something we actually also do actively, step into coach and help and support in the surrounding. That's also into the, uh, that supporting arrow. And then we see this connection between like, when you know where you're heading together, uh, it also helps out 
when it comes to building up the psychological safety so that you feel comfortable in this team and it really affects each other right so it's, it becomes like a positive spiral um so um, much more could be said about that but I, I think we can jump to to next um one yeah let us just touch very quickly upon this uh, this one uh and that is about the leadership uh, and that it need to be a little bit different uh martin has already touched upon it uh, a bit um but this is the old thing we have talked about for for a very very long time we have talked about situational based uh, leadership right uh and this is just a, a reminder of, of that that we need to tailor our way of addressing a teams and people uh understanding where the team are right so sometimes you know we want to be on the right side right we want to have this like delegating leadership and so on uh but I, what i have seen many times if you step in with that approach from day one when you're forming a team that might be a little bit confusing to everyone involved actually and that people actually ask for and need a little bit more clear and present leadership but that we also need to make that journey. Uh, me, myself, I could just be um, take my own example, could sometimes feel a little bit uncomfortable being on the left side, right? Uh, in that sense, when it comes to, to leading. I want everyone to be involved. I want to delegate, etc. I already want to be on the right side, but sometimes we really need to, to do this work. And it, this is not something new to you. You have heard it many, many times, but we really want to connect the dots here um, and see that that is needed. Uh, but because there could also be a lot of like informal leadership also in a team that you need to work with. Then you need to help maybe a technical expert to maybe start delegating, uh, sharing knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so many flavors into this. Um, Something you want to add there, Martin, or shall we jump to next? No, we can we can move to the next one. I think oh. uh, we are pressed in time, and I think people might have want to yeah. go to the Q and A also. Yes. So another important part is conflict management. Uh, in teams, we need we have to have conflicts; otherwise, it won't work. That's the most important ingredients of any team is to have conflicts, but they need to be constructive. So we don't want any of these two. We don't want the conflict avoiding behavior and we don't want these personal conflicts that assaults to happen. So we, we try to make use of a, of a model that is from Patrick Lancioni, which is called the conflict continuum. We decided to call it the conflict spectrum instead because yeah, it could also be a spectrum maybe. So what we talk about and we work with it is that we see that and we try to map it to the team development stages that we've been talking about. So in the artificial harmony on the left side, uh, it's typically a stage one type of team. They avoid conflicts because they don't feel safe. So they need to challenge themselves in order to start to initiate discussions and reflect on things. And yeah, in stage two, they start to do that and could be that they end up on the right side instead, the destructive personal assault level. And that is, of course, the reason why the team are cautious in actually initiating discussions and reflections, because they are a bit afraid of what happens if I go too far. Because a team don't know what too far is yet. They need to practice that because it's different in all teams. At Wireless Car, we have, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, 40 different uh, cultures within the company. So everyone have different ways of handling discussions and conflict. So conflict management is even more important in our context because we don't know how different cultures manage and work with uh, different types of conflicts. How do we initiate things and talk about that? So the team needs to find their optimal zone. So it's a tuning, tuning work that needs to be done. And we want to support that behavior uh, and reflections about those things. So we have a different different types of exercises also in the team development toolbox to work with these type of approaches also in a cultural perspective. 
enough about that, I think, Linus. Or do you want yeah. to add something? Yeah, yeah, it's just so important. Uh, and, and we have found that many, many times. And it's really nice when you see a team moving from um, yeah, being on the either side, but really step into having those those productive uh, conflicts. Um, and uh, it's always so so nice to to see that that happens actually in the team, nailing that that green area, mm -hmm. and actually just can add on. I mean, it actually applies to any kind of relationships, <laughs> also like in marriage or whatever. Uh, it's uh, this is where we want to be, right? I mean, able to talk about things in a productive way, uh, right? Um, that is where we, yeah, things really can happen, and where we are meeting each other. So uh, yeah, we, but let's move on. So uh, let's look into a little bit into the horizon, right? Um, so and how we plan to continue our journey, and if we just look into the near uh, future, uh, we are. Uh, re right now, uh, to be uh, very open here, we are looking into uh, identifying and address negative structural behaviors in the organization. This is like, it's not that it's uh, any kind of like uh, uh, catastrophic uh, behaviors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, like I said in the beginning, we have a really good culture at, at Wireless Car. But do we have things to work on that we can improve? to make the perfect like environment for our teams? Yes, we can. So we want to identify those and work with those in a structured manner also. Uh, so that's uh, the, the bullet one. Uh, next thing is that sometimes we see that maybe it's not, because what we haven't said here is actually, we work actually only on pull basis here. So it's like teams are signing up. We are not forcing any teams to to join this and or to be a part of it. Actually, um, every team at Wireless Car is supposed to work on continuous improvements, uh, work on team development for sure. But they don't need to use. We are not uh, dictating like what tools to use. Um, we have a couple we offer, but um, they are free to use whatever they like. Uh, but what we've seen sometimes is that those stage one and two teams that maybe also have got stuck there uh, maybe are not the first ones to actually reach out to for help either so there is a little bit of a question for us like how can we give active support to them and reach out um, to to help them um, and the third one is to investigate and try out complementary tools. We have focused quite a lot on this, this tool that we have talked about uh, uh, today. It's not the only one, but the primary one. So uh, yeah, we are a little bit, uh, we are too curious, I would say, <laughs> to, to not dig into to others. Uh, there are a lot of uh, things out there. Uh, and if we look into, connected to that, look into long-term, uh, that would be to, even more like build our own tailored model and, and tools and so on. And uh, where that will take us, we have no uh, no idea, but that's uh, something we talked about just a couple of weeks ago in the crew. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and uh, maybe you want to team up with us uh, or something like that uh, to create like, a, who knows, a bigger community in that uh, and how we can build that. Uh, that could be super interesting. Yeah, that was just a couple of glimpses uh, from uh, what we see uh, for the future. So let's uh, hand over to you, Ingela, and uh, the Q&A. Yeah, great. Really interesting to learn how structured you work with uh, getting the teams to, to perform together. Um, we have some questions regarding how involved um, support functions is in your value stream, like sales, marketing, and other functions? And is it about like in team development or, or if they are a part of it? Because they are also, we are offering this to, so I will actually meet, meet up with, with the sales and marketing team uh, in uh, just a couple of weeks to work with that, that team. But I'm not sure if that was the question, but we offered this to, to Carl, all kind of. It was your question. May Paul, would you like to place your question? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I, I'm starting to think about how to, uh, when you work in team-based, so you have like uh, Martin Keegan and stuff. Like, 
folks like that, I would say that you should integrate uh, different kind of functionalities to build like a product team. They were a product manager and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. This seems like more like an um, techno, like you how you organize development right now. And I, my question was, how do you organize like the, the product or the value stream with the different kind of functional? Because I, I usually met like development teams are quite uh, keen on in organizing like this, and then you work like or like different kind of working structures, like more like waterfall or uh, mm -hmm. in in other functional areas, and it's also usually a quite a big conflict and you end up like you the sales dictate what you do anyway in some ways then you end up like uh, yeah semi structured try it, but you're not reaching that far mm -hmm. i would say mm -hmm. martin uh, where should i <laughs> you go I mean, I mean, I think there were several things here <laughs> that uh, could uh, we could uh, have uh, another meetup about. I think, but I think if I got you right, I mean, I think like I touched upon here before is that like our teams are into a context, so uh, this this could also, I mean, what. It could affect the team like how we have written the contracts with our customers right so that affects our teams highly in, in a lot actually and uh and also how we set up the whole the whole value stream and uh, uh we have been working with that um at least um uh, i would say uh, with the, with the, some parts of our organization and um, Maybe you want to touch upon that, Martin, because you have been involved in yeah, one I, of those I, at least. I, I'm I'm part of talking and reflecting on different types of silos and other things within the organization. That they see exists in all organization and they should be there. We need the structure, but they have secondary effects like loss of sight of value streams and other things because they normally stream through different types of silos. But it's not connected to team development crew assignment, even though they are, of course, connected in the sense that they could block team development. And I think that is what you are after here, uh, Carl. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, because you're trying really hard to be agile. Yeah. And, and then so, the rest of the organization doesn't really follow along. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So so it it's a structural behavior that needs to be attended to when being people need to be aware of that that structural behavior is is there and then we can start to approach it and and there are some problems and challenges at wireless car as with any organization that we're working with uh, mm -hmm. connected to this um but we are attending to it that is so, what I can say yeah exactly yeah and like I said before I'm working also in the way of working team so of course we are addressing that uh, or also working with that uh, but if we turn it really to be into the team development area it's important here that we like we said before uh, let the, the team also understand that you, they are a part of this context and that we also need to work with that with that that environment that context that is the first thing but when you talk about that it could be easy for a team then to say like yeah but it's on the outside it's purely on the outside so it's someone else that need to make a change but something here that i found in, uh, important is also that to let a team understand also that they can actually work on how they tackles this because the environment will be challenging and it will continue to be challenging it is challenging to work in these kind of environments so then we need to develop our skills as a team how we address that uh does it make sense yeah, yeah I, so can, it, I can i want to add one one thing there because the more empowered the team or the more team developed the closest to stage three and four they are the easier i see it is for them to start to reflect on their context, their external context, and start to approach that. Uh, maybe using the Scrum Master as their tool to get that change going. So if they feel that they are blocked by uh, product management because they are dictating things that is not really connected to the reality, but that the team is, are seeing, they can, when they start to feel that they have power 
to actually influence and work with that, that they feel that that's part of their purpose to actually do those things, they will start to create, uh, which we see at Wireless Car, they start to create this reach out for connection and, and boundary spanning between different silos. So that is what we can see. I mean, I've seen that at Wireless Car. Thank you for the question. Yes, thank um, you. Yeah, um, we have a question from Kevin regarding the support on individual level. Kevin, would you like to raise the question yourself? Yeah, hi folks. Um, you know, really, 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 really good stuff. And I love the way, you know, we're sort of progressing just back into my office now. So I'll start my video here uh, so you can see me. So, um, you know, really, really, really progressive. Love the integration of previous theories, et cetera, and the tooling side of it and the measurement side. But, you know, it's just something we know, and you mentioned it yourself at the beginning, is that teams themselves are not a, uh, a, a an, an entity in themselves. They are made up of individuals. And we know that some of this conflict behavior, handling conflict, agile working, um, stage four, if you like, all stage type behaviors, different individuals will have different comfort levels with that. So um, interested about the individual dimension to this and how maybe that has been recognized that not everybody is the same in terms of their comfort and their likes and dislikes about teams and team formation. So just wondering is that the, the toolkit and development process include, and even the measurement process include uh, the individual dimension, not just mm. the team level dimension. Yeah. We, we, could, we could, oh, it's okay, Linus, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the quick answer is that, that you can look at subgroups uh, in this particular tool that we are talking about here. Uh, we are not pointing out individuals uh, because that's something we don't want to do in this this uh, this way because then it's, it becomes too pointy, right, uh, to bring someone out. Uh, but if we have two or three more people, uh, we can actually look at that, think a little bit of the same uh, when we're doing this kind of survey, we can look at that. And that is very, very common uh, to see in, in different teams. And that's also something that I really like with this, this uh, GDQ, is that you can see these subgroups um, and you can do any analysis on, the, uh, 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 on that. Because just like you said, people are different. Maybe someone joined in late. Of course, they will feel in a different way than the others that have maybe been in this team for like two or three years, of course. So we need to address it. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that was a good enough answer to you. But... No, I can just compliment on that because <clears throat> the, the subgroups is a way we, we show these subgroups to the teams when we are after the GDQ in the workshop where we do together with the team so that they can be aware of that the team actually have different opinions about the team. So it, it's not unrare to see half of the team or a major part of the team view the team as a stage four team and another part view it as a stage one or two team. And just being able to visualize that helps the team to see what steps we need to take in order to understand each other better I and mean, usually what we see is that they, they as they progress in the different gdqs is that they are more aligned on what they want to have and um, maybe they the the one in stage feel that the team is in stage four move back to stage three and the one other ones so they are more equal in what they view the team is and it, being able to do that helps them to progress further but to be super clear here we're never pointing out individuals so there are never any names on it we're just looking at that we see differences uh yeah yeah and uh, i didn't and i didn't, and that, I didn't mean that yeah. at all it, it was mm. more about the supportive side as you say at the very right. beginning uh yeah. you know but, it, it's a recognition of that individual for sure but, that but then doesn't also take on away, uh, if I may add, uh, there, that doesn't take away, of course, that we work with individuals and uh, working close to, to line managers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there can be many, many, many reasons <laughs> to do that, right? Um, but this is looking at like team behaviors, uh, and that's how we address it. Yeah. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Um, the clock is ticking. So I think we will do a cut here. There are some questions in the chat uh, regarding um, conflict resolutions and so on. Um, we can say, Martin, that we will have a podcast follow up and then we will build in some of the questions that you have in the chat, which Can you say something more about that, Martin? Yeah, yeah I don't know. I, your sound is <clears throat> breaking up. I don't know if it's just for me or others, but <clears throat> I can repeat what I think you said, at least. And that is that uh, during next week or so, me and Linus and David um, will record a podcast as a follow-up to this, um, this uh, presentation. And we will bring the questions that we did not manage to answer during this time period here into that uh, podcast. And we will propose that in, in the different forums so that you can reach out and see that when you want to follow up. And of course, if you want to, you can of course connect, contact any on one of us, Linus or me uh, on LinkedIn, if you have specific questions or, or thoughts that you would like to soundboard or reflect on. Great. Uh, then I think we say thank you for today. Um, thanks for joining. We have already planned a new um, uh, new stories from reality. In May, it will be about uh, value uh, on all levels, how you can use it in work, but also in your personal life uh, to get harmony uh, in your life and uh, working life. So great thank you to Martin and Linus. It was really, really interesting to learn how you work with uh, teams uh, in, in, and, and that you also have a continuous plan uh, for, for the next coming step. So again, thanks for today.